Well, this is Canick Village in Strathglass. Strath, a wide place where people live. It couldn't be more appropriate. But way back until 19, the mid-40s, there wasn't a village here at all. This village really sprang up with the building of a great hydroelectric complex in three glens. And from this position here, three of the major glens of Scotland penetrate right through to the west coast. So we're virtually almost in the middle of Scotland now, between the North Sea and the Atlantic. And this place has always been a place of settlement, notably by the Chisholm clan. And about 1945, when the Scottish National Parks Committee were thinking of areas for the future that could be national parks, lungs for the people, their minds centred here because of the possibility of walking right through from Bewley, right through over 20 miles across the mountains, finishing up in Kintail. A marvellous prospect, and I was one of those who looked forward to this taking place. But instead of that taking place, in 1947, the Hydroelectric Board Act was passed and it was decided to build great power schemes and harness the power of these glens because in the past they'd been notorious for flooding the people out of their homes. And it was a good idea to harness it. The only snag is you can't reconcile two things. You can't keep a glen natural and at the same time make some of the biggest dams in Scotland. And in this lonely place here, an army of some 1,500 men moved in. And for a year or two, there was chaos in this glen. And then in 1951, the power flowed, the scheme, the first phase, was in operation. And those of us who loved Glen Affric felt very despondent because so much was underwater. But a lot of time has passed. The old work camp became a forester's camp. Houses were occupied, had never been occupied before by people who were actually working on the glen. A miracle has taken place in the interval. And I'm going to look at it today and I'm expecting something good. Well, I thought the brilliant sunshine was too good to last. The sun would have roasted you yesterday. And today, I've moved into winter into Glen Affric. I must say, though, it's really a marvellous scene. A fairyland. All the birch trees here are almost like Christmas trees. Great bluffs with icicles hanging. Below me, the river with great lumps of ice. Few pine trees. This is just the very edge of the big forest, the primeval forest of Scotland. And thinking of how it came to disappear, one of the possible explanations, apart from the early burning by man, may have been that the climate moved against it. Because when the original forest grew up, Scotland, in fact, had a marvellous, sunny, dry climate. And that was before man came to it. The evidence is only in the peat bogs. But up here, we can see very much a relic, a primeval relic, and I'm looking forward to seeing it through the eyes of Finlay McRae, the district officer of Easter Rossshire, whose beat is Glen Affric. If you're looking for a special bit of big, untamed Highland country, you could hardly do better than come here. It's easy to get the feeling that there's nobody else in the world except you. And it's not just because the hills are the highest in Scotland, north of the Great Glen. No, it's the way it's cut up by wooded rock bluffs. In fact, you've got to traverse 10 miles of narrow road before you come to an inhabited house. You're more likely to meet a red deer than a human being. And when the road ends, you're in nothing more than a footpath leading 18 miles on to Loch Duich in Kintail. But I'm expecting to be picked up by a man who knows it intimately. Well, Finlay McCree, it's a fine snowy morning for going up to Glen Affric. Yes, it's rather a pity that I had to drag you out in a day like this, Tom. Oh, well, I'm hoping for better things, even yeah. although this is one of the, the notoriously unsettled bits of Scotland. That's right. 
and your district is mainly a good weather area, so why are you so far west here? Well, this is an enclave, a separate uh, enclave in my district that takes me almost to Kintail, which suits me very well. I like to have my feet in the west. That's because you're a skyman. Oh yes, that's right. And this particular glen, I know, because it's uh, a country of very high peaks and very wild forest, it's posed a lot of problems in Scottish history, hasn't it? Yes, it's, um, I suppose it must have been about the wildest country in Scotland. And um, it's still, um, the western reaches of this glen are still among the, perhaps the finest scenery in Scotland and probably the wildest country. And I think perhaps the, the trees add something to this scene. This forest came here really when the ice receded. So we're looking, or we're talking about a forest that's been in existence for about eight or 9,000 years. And I think one of the reasons that foresters tended to neglect the, 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 the Afric pines was it was all deer forest. A hundred years ago, it was entirely sporting. That's right, the, the pine forest really was used as a, a sanctuary for deer in the winter time. They um, found uh, plenty of shelter in the forest and also rough vegetation for browsing. And part of the browsing was on the trees? Part of the browsing was on the pine forest. So no wee trees got a chance to grow up? That's right, between sheep and deer, the, um, the pine forest gradually disappeared. So in Glen Afric, despite the length of the glen and such a marvellous stretch of old pines, there were all old veterans getting close to the last legs. That's right, Tom. About We have trees up here that are 300, 330 years old. And um, once you get to that age, you're bound to be on your last leg. Well, undoubtedly, it was the sheer ruggedness of this heathery country which prevented the complete destruction of the pine forest. Somehow or other, the best parts remaining had to be enclosed to allow new seedlings to grow up. A mighty job and an expensive one to tackle. Oh, well, we're in amongst them now. There you are, there, Temple. the sun coming through, too. You'll be able to see. Well, we're at the beginning of uh, Loch Benavian here. And from here to the west, really, is the, is the reserve, especially on the, on the southern side of Benevian. This is where the enclosures are. Uh -huh. Now, this is really the beginning of the artificial lock. That's right, yes. And this small dam is really all there is of dam in Glen Affric. This is all in the whole of Glen Affric, yes. So the water is pumped through, you see, from, uh, from Maladoch through to this one. By tunnel through the mountain. A tunnel through the mountain, that's right. And in this way yeah. they managed to hold Glen Afric as natural as we well, see it today. Pretty well as it is. Now, I think I'm right in saying that in historical times in the last 300 years there's been nothing but destruction of this forest. That's right, that's the history of it, sadly. And a destruction mainly caused by thoughtless land use. Man has burnt it to make grazings for sheep. He's also used it for the smelting of iron. He's overgrazed it to make deer forests and something had to go and that was a natural pine. That's correct, yes. So, Finlay, when you said you divided it into three areas, you mean you fenced them? That's right, they were fenced. Uh, initially, there was one large enclosure and then we subdivided that by using two fences. So we have, we have three separate fenced areas now. Totaling how many acres? About two and a half thousand acres. Yes. And what about this we're looking at now then? Well, if you look down the glen here, you'll see that even out with the fenced area, we're getting regeneration here, largely because of this reduction in the grazing pressure. Animals don't want to come in to graze by those roadsides, which are very much busier now too, remember, there are more people coming into the glen. So that this really got a chance to come away on the tunnel spoil, and this is growing very successfully. Changed days since these glens were sacred to sportsmen who kept their estates very private. Now the visitor is encouraged to walk and enjoy a path like this one, especially built for pleasure. Well, this is an enclosed hill, wide open to sheep and deer grazing. Animals have got to be considered as well as man. 
and Finlay has to look very closely at every aspect of land use. The path was made here because of the very exciting vistas through the trees. And you can see if you look down here that a lot of the old Caledonian pines are now starting to degenerate, they're dying off. I see the skeletons there. Then. That's right. This is because we're an open range here. The deer and the sheep are free to graze here and, and there can't be any regeneration in that circumstance. So the trees have no future at all Not here. really, those here have no chance, no. So what we're going to do then is go down by the river and follow it round and get the idea of the varied country in this short stretch. That's right, yes. And this little walk that you've laid out for visitors, it really needs fairly careful placing of the feet because it's a fairly sharp we descent here. Well, I think if you're young and sprightly, it's fine, but if you're getting on, you've got to like, be careful. Like myself, yes. Well, not quite <laughs> like you, Tom. <laughs> Let's go then, eh? Right, all right. You were showing that sprightliness now, you see, which <laughs> there's some doubt about. <laughs> it is. Oh, it's very nice here, though. It's very bracing, isn't it? Yes, it it really is. It's keen air. Keen air. I've always been a lover of the snow. Got to keep going here to keep yourself warm. What do you think of this fine stretch of water here, Tom? Oh, a great stretch. Isn't it? Oh, okay. great. And all the better, Finlay, for realising that if the engineers had had their original proposals passed, we would have lost this in one great stretch of water which would have swallowed up the Hafric and Loch Bonavon. That's right. Nice and open here, Finlay. Isn't it lovely? Oh, yes. We're, we're travelling now, you see, of course, through this open range. But over across the river here is one of the main enclosures. And if you look, you can see the young regeneration coming oh, up there. Of course you can, yes. yes. But there's the regeneration within the deer fence, and it's all perfectly natural, that. We didn't plant any of that. You merely excluded the grazing animals and gave the trees a chance to grow. That's right. So the deer are OK in here, but what happens if they get in oh, there? Oh, if they get in there, we're in a lot of bother. They'll eat many of those young trees. In fact, large numbers of deer getting in there would destroy that now. I don't think you could see Loch Benevian under more splendid winter conditions than what you're seeing now. Like a fragment stolen from the Canadian Rockies. Pines, peaks, water. And beyond the very end of the road, I met two deer-stalking brothers, Donald and Duncan MacLennan, who grew up in these hills. They knew the better days of deer stalking. See, these old days, the estates had big staffs. There was plenty of work for gillies, butlers and servants in the season. Everything was geared to the grouse, the fishing, the deer stalking. Very few tourists ever came to disturb the peace. But the Great War saw the end of that peaceful era. The rich people weren't quite so rich. Many of the lodges mouldered. This house and its shooting lodge is one of the very remotest in Scotland. I asked Duncan MacLennan how he came to live here. 
Well, uh, I was came here as a deer stalker, but then back about 1950, times began to change and they had to put sheep onto the hills. So I was asked if I would do the sheep, so I said I would. You've got to move for the times. But it means uh, a lot of hard work. Many sheep? 1,500 breeding ewes, scattered over about 30,000 acres. And that acre should be pretty small just now, mind you. And the sheep will be pretty hungry, but they're hardy. But come the summertime, the acres are all clear and the sheep are well scattered. And uh, right up till now, of course, in all this cold weather, you've been working with the deer at the Hines. We've been at the Hines since uh, November, yes. Killing how many? We killed 140. That's what we're uh, told to kill by the Deer Commission, a sixth of our stock, in other words. Well, many people would think that's a, a year's work in its own. Yes, it uh, was pretty difficult this year with the ice. You know, we couldn't uh, work the ponies properly with the ice. And, we found it very difficult. This was an abnormally hard winter here, oh, was it? Very hard winter. I would say it's even worse than the big storm we had last year. It's going on too long. And come the lambing season, then you've got to be out up in the tops here and maybe dealing with a lot of mortality as a result of the winter. Well, it's just a case of... Uh, we'll go through the sheep just now as soon as the storm goes off and we'll take the weak ones out and uh, we'll take them in, give them a bit of feed that the rest will be uh, on the open hill and uh, look after themselves pretty well. We've got to look after the fox. The fox is the main thing. We keep the fox down, sheep will look after themselves. Now, I would like to ask your brother a question because Donald McLennan, I know that you've changed your lifestyle and that you used to be a keeper in this very place. Yes. And now you're a forestry commission ranger. That's right, Tom, yeah. Now, That's what's right. the difference between a keeper and a forestry commission ranger? Well, the difference between the two is that uh, a keeper looks after the game and the deer. That's his job of work. Mine is the protection of the trees. I have to protect them from the deer, but it doesn't mean to say that I go around with a rifle slaughtering deer uh, wholesale or anything like that. In vulnerable areas, if there's any deer in it, well, we kill them. But in the non-vulnerable areas and grown forests, the deer are very welcome to be in it. And we're very glad to have them there when we have guests out to shoot them. You see, that's the difference in the two jobs. So otherwise, your work is very much like your brother's in the way of fencing and draining and things like that? Oh, yes. Uh, number one job with us is uh, in the protection of the forest is maintaining the fences, patrolling them to see if there's no holes, snow drifts where deer can get in, open gates, etc., etc. And on the other hand, we have to control, as well as the deer would control foxes, any of these predators, because if uh, the fox with his family, comes out of my part of the neck of the woods, we'll say, into my brother's ground, kill his lambs, I'm in trouble. You understand? Oh, I understand. I also understand that you never go away on a holiday either in the, in the accepted sense of maybe going a far place. How do you spend your holidays? Oh, a best month's holiday. Best month's holiday. Doing what I do at work and getting paid for it. Fishing, shooting, stalking. That's the way I spend the holidays. So the pair of you can't really get enough of work? Well, if you enjoy what you're doing and look forward to Monday morning coming, you're enjoying what you're doing. Glen Canick lies north just across the ridge from Glen Affric and has a certain matching beauty in its lower parts. First time I came here was long before the hydroelectric dam had been built across it, turning two lochs into one. The dam itself, two and a half thousand feet long, 116 feet high, makes it the biggest in Scotland. And from its top, looking down it, you realise how high up you are, and away to the west, the two sheets of water now turned into one. Donald McLennan has seen the changes because he was a deer stalker well, here. the new 
Loch Malana, nine miles long, and you've uh, spent a lot of years as a ghillie in this loch. Then. Ten years as a trout fishing ghillie in the summertime. But when the north wind uh, gets up to gale force there, it's no summer, believe you me. And you've got to use a boat because there's not even a track up the edge of there's the loch. There's no track, there. no track where a road used to be. And that road used to serve three shooting lodges? Oh, yes, oh, yes. Cossack, Benula, and uh, the old Benula Lodge. And each of these lodges had a deer stalker in it? Oh, yes, oh, yes. After that nostalgic walk to that glen of great change, we returned to the stalker's cottage in Loch Afric. I think it takes a very special kind of a person to live happily in the kind of isolation that used to be regarded as normal in these glens. You've got to be self-sufficient, adaptable when the winter cuts you off from the outside world. You're thrown back in your own resources. I wondered how Mrs. McLennan and young Duncan enjoyed living here. Well, it's been the only home I've known since I married. I dread to think of the day he retires. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> yes. But you've got your son here, Duncan, who was born here. You're 24, Duncan. That's right, Tom, yes. And do you enjoy it here? Oh, yes, yes. I wouldn't be here if not, I don't think. And I know, I know that, that you've got hires and all the rest of it, but uh, you want to be a keeper like your dad. Well, it's a life you enjoy. I wouldn't like to be sitting in an office. I love the hills and outdoors. So the prospect of 34 years here wouldn't appall you? Well, I think I started a bit younger than my father. I might make more than that. <laughs> <laughs> well spoken. <laughs> now, for you, Mrs McLennan, I know that when you came here first, it must have been very difficult to get to the outside world. Oh, yes, I couldn't drive, you see. I had depended on my husband. And it was a very bad Didn't road in these oh, days, too. Oh, very bad. Before the Hydra scheme made the new one, you know. Before the new... And then when you come back up through the Caledonian Pines, yes. up the frozen loch, how do you feel when you get home? Well, wonderful. Wonderful to be back. Yes, yes. I'm thankful to be back for peace and quiet. And you're looking forward to the lambing season and then another deer stocking season. Yes, that's it, Tom. There'll be foxes in between that as well. Well, it's great to meet really contented people. I believe you've made me a bit more contented too. Finley McRae playing a peabrook against the pine trees he's loved and cultivated. There's an old Highland saying, Boon mar and gushus, which means lasting as the pine. And I think that's true of its people as well. <laughs> 